Good morning, everyone. Uh, we will start the sixth edition of uh, our international seminar series from uh, the graduate program in ecology from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, I'm really happy to be hosting uh, this talk today with Adriane Esquivel Mulbert, uh, previous student from, from our program, a colleague, a previous colleague from, from, from our program here. And now she's a lecturer uh, in global forest ecology at the University of Birmingham. Uh, she will talk about functional floristic and stand dynamics across Amazon forests. And uh, please feel free to ask questions in, in our uh, YouTube chat and we'll uh, have a question Q and I uh, session after her talk. Uh, welcome, Adriani. Uh, really happy to have you here. Thank you, Fernanda. I can share my screen. Yes, I will share here. And I will leave to the backstage and call me if you need me. Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks Fernando for the invitation and thanks everyone uh, for being here. I'm very happy, as Fernando said, I'm, uh, I'm a previous student from, from URGIS, from the uh, ecology postgraduate course. And it's a place where I learned so much about ecology and really changed my career. And it's a place that I had a lot of fun and I still have a lot of friends from there. So I'm really happy to be sharing some of my work with my great friends. Um, I'm going to talk today about the Amazon. So I used to study the Atlantic forest and then during my PhD, I changed and started uh, working with the Amazon and I've been working with Amazon forests since then. Um, uh, this work, um, it's also work of many, many people. I have some names here on the screen, but also really it's a big collective work from many ecologists across South America and elsewhere. Um, so we now face one of humanity's greatest environmental challenge, if not humanity's greatest environmental challenge of all times. And these are very pressing times where we really, really need to understand our, our, our natural systems. And forests are at the center of this problem. Um, they are home to 25% of human population and to 80% of terrestrial biodiversity. They also play a major role storing and sequestering carbon. So here you can see uh, the carbon, so the, the carbon cycle, so the, the, the mean fluxes of carbon between uh, 2009 and 2018. And uh, in the left, you can see uh, the emissions in terms of uh, fossil fuels. Um, so here you have coal, oil, gas in uh, gigatons per year. And in, um, in yellow here, you have the emissions uh, from land use change. So this is all that have been emitted to the atmosphere. On the other side, on the right, you have uh, the carbon that goes um, where, the, where the carbon is going, basically. So you have the uptake from the oceans and the uptake from land. And you have this um, atmospheric increase that is basically what uh, is not taken back by oceans or land. It's then it's going to the atmosphere. And this is the, the blue bar here. It what is causing our problems. Um, so this green bar here is, is the amount of carbon taken up by photosynthesis and, and then storing as either wood vegetation or in soils. Um, so we have 3.2 gigatons per year and 2.4 of these, around 2.4 of these are uh, taken up by forests. And forests also, they can store this carbon as their in their trunks for a long time. So they have a big importance also, not just as a carbon sink, but also as a carbon source. And the Amazon plays a big role 
in this story because it's um it's a massive forest the biggest tropical forest on earth and uh it stores around uh 12 percent of the terrestrial carbon uh sorry it's uh it, it's responsible for 12 percent of that terrestrial carbon sink that i showed you before and it's it stores around 150 and 200 petagrams of carbon um so in understanding the Amazon, it's an important piece in understanding the, the whole carbon dynamics. And we know these numbers, we know the amount of carbon sink that the Amazon can, uh, the role of the Amazon as a carbon sink from several um, techniques. And one of these techniques, one of these metrics, uh, one of these ways of understanding the carbon dynamics is um, through forest inventory plots. So this basically is measuring forest, measuring trees over time. So following the life and death of trees in a set area, and then doing that multiple times um, and across. So if possible to actually get a sense of an understanding of, of Amazon carbon dynamics, do that um, across uh, several uh, places. So over time, we build a picture of what's happening in terms of forest dynamics, and then we can understand the capacity of that forest to absorb and store carbon. So here you have a photo of someone taking a diameter. This is not a breast height because here, we, because the tree is so big, you have to use a ladder to climb to a place where the actual the tree is actually um, a circu circumference, so it, the diameter can be measured. But and then a very very important thing uh, for tropical systems, they are very diverse, is to understand the species composition, uh, so we can actually estimate the amount of carbon that each tree stores. So here we have a team. Um, in central Amazon, um, preparing samples so that the species can be identified. Um, these are botanical vouchers. Um, and with this information for many years and in different locations, we can get uh, this curve, which, which is the curve of cumulative change in above ground biomass. So this is basically the balance between growth uh, and recruitment and mortality. And here in the end of the 90s, we could see that the Amazon was a carbon sink because the line here is above zero. So the forest is accumulating more carbon than emitting. And we can also see that this capacity of accumulating carbon was increasing over time. If we pass forward a little bit, um, then we have this other curve, there is a continuation of this um, study with more plots now across a greater area. And we see that although the Amazon is still a carbon sink here in 2010, um, the line is still above zero. The capacity to absorb carbon is declining over time. So we have a, a negative slope here. Um, there are different reasons so for this um, extra, to try to explain what's happening in the dynamics of the forest. If uh, this forest was in equilibrium, then you expect that the line, the grain line, will be on top of this zero line here. However, the forest is not in equilibrium. And uh, there are different explanations to this uh, drive to the to what's driving um, this forest being outside of equilibrium. For instance, uh, one of the main explanations for the forest being above zero, so being a carbon sink, is the CO2 fertilization hypothesis. So this is the idea that with greater CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, the forest could potentially increase the photo photosynthetic capacity and then store more carbon, so produce more, um, uh, do more photosynthesis and then uh, produce more, more uh, synthesize more carbon and then store more carbon in the trunks and then um, become a, a, a carbon sink. On the other hand, 
this line is declining and there's something uh, pushing the, the line downwards. And this could be also a consequence of CO2 fertilization because with greater carbon availability, then the system will move faster. So the plants will grow, will grow faster and, and also die younger. So at some point, this capacity to accumulate carbon will be lost and then it will decline as we are seeing here. So the, one of the hypotheses is that this, now the Amazon is kind of um, adjusting to this extra CO2. And another uh, hypothesis, it's uh, the effect of droughts. So here we have some uh, valleys in the curve in 2005 and 2010. And these valleys coincide with the years with greater drought, greater droughts in the Amazon. So in 2005, we had the biggest year in the last 100 years. And then in 2010, you have a very big drought again, as big as 2005. So these two droughts, uh, they are potentially responsible for a decline in, in the carbon and then net biomass change which means that you have more trees dying during those droughts and then the capacity to accumulate carbon during that year, it's uh, lower. But um, I'm, I was interested in not only understanding the carbon dynamics, but trying to understand what's behind, so what's causing it. And, and also to understand what's happening to the species that are in the Amazon. So, um, in, in my PhD, we, we uh, put forward a few hypotheses that we could test um, regard, we, using the species and functional groups. And that will tell you a little bit more about what are the drivers of, um, of net biomass change across the Amazon, but also it, the, by looking at the species, we could understand uh, what's happening with, um, with with the composition of the forest over time. So is the forest changing uh, only in terms of carbon dynamics or is this change happening via a change in composition? So are the fundamental units of the forest the species changing over time and is the forest becoming something different? Um, so we have here uh, a few hypotheses. So if, we, if, you, if the carbon fertilization hypothesis is correct, we expect that uh, the species that will be selected over time are the bigger species, so the, the, the species that are the best competitors for light and water, so they can do better under greater resource availability. Also, we expect that over time, wood density would decline. So you have, um, you have this, those species that have the capacity so they 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 can make the most under um under a little increase in resource they will grow faster so and they can make the most of uh the the greater um frequency of gaps so if you increase co2 and you have a more dynamic forest then you have more gaps and then it, the the for the trees with low density will do better from the drought side, we expect actually that uh, you have a community with lower um, size. So over time, you tend to filter for the smaller trees because big trees they are more likely to suffer from hydraulic failure. And you expect um, species that have higher drought tolerance. However, drought tolerance is something very hard to measure. So you could use hydraulic traits, but at the time that we were doing this study, there were only very few species which had known how hydro hydraulic traits for the Amazon. So we tried here to create an understanding of drought tolerance across the Amazon. So we could test our hypothesis that drought tolerance, it, drought tolerance is increasing over time. To do, to do that, to get an understanding of drought tolerance across the Amazon, first we look at uh, the distribution of species. So we ask uh, this question whether 
biogeography can predict drought tolerance. So with information from the distribution of species, we would get a sense of how tolerant the species are. Um, so first we, we uh, look at the distribution of species across these plots in the um, west of the Amazon. This region is a region where soil is quite fertile. So nutrient availability would not be uh, here uh, impeding the distribution of species, but you have a lot of pockets of uh, rainfall and, and pockets of low and high rainfall. So, so the, here, the, the distribution of rainfall, it's quite, uh, it's not really uh, correlated across space. You have different gradients across, across different places. And uh, so we look at the distribution here and we generated an index, which is basically the center of gravity of the distribution of the species across um, a gradient of a water deficit, which is an important variable that we use um, for, for uh, to understand the length and the frequency of um, the dry season. So the length and intensity of the dry season. So we use this variable that is called um, MCWD, which is cumulative water deficit. And uh, we then we looked at how, how the species are distributed across this gradient of um, water deficit. And, and then for each species, we, we calculated a center of gravity. So this center of gravity represents where the species are more abundant, abundant um, across this gradient of climate. And then um, based on this, um, then we ask the questions whether uh, mortality is greater for a species. Mortality at drought con in, during drought condition is greater for a species that have, um, they are more tolerant to drought, so they have their center of gravity in drier places. So we calculated this delta M, which is the, the delta mortality, the drought-induced mortality. So it's a mortality in a drought place and in a non-drought place, non-drought condition. And for that, we to calculate this uh, drought-induced mortality, we use a few um, true-fall exclusion experiments. So the one in Tapajós and Cachuana, in which they uh, actually kind of cover the forest, cover the the soil and don't allow rain for a few years and we look at mortality in the control and then in the in the experiment plot here we also look at mortality in a drought in a El Nino drought in 1982 and 1983 in Bajo Colorado Island in Panama and a few seedling experiments one in Bolivia and then another in Panama so in each of the experiments we looked at we found a positive relationship between drought-induced mortality and water deficit affiliation. So no matter uh, where the experiment was, the species that were more affiliated to dry conditions were also the ones that had um, lower mortality rates. So drought condition, drought condition is like minus, the more negative here, the, the greater the affiliation to drought, dry conditions and then the lower the mortality rate under a drought experiment. So we could use then this index of uh, water deficit affiliation to try to predict what happens uh, across the basin over time, asking the question of whether uh, you had an increase in drought tolerance over, over time looking at the inventory plots. So now that we have this drought tolerance, drought toler the tolerance index, we can look at what happened in terms of species composition across the Amazon. And for that, I was very for fortunate to use this um, 30 years data set with um, over 100 long-term inventory plots and over 100,000 trees and more than 3,000 species. And this is a data set that uh, um, it's basically created from several researchers across South America that have been working uh, in the Amazon for many years and 
in each of these so each of these dots here is like a plot or a group of plots where people have been uh, monitoring forests over a long time so this is um, an important point because any type of research long-term research that we need to do it's it's very hard and it's very hard to maintain so it's a massive effort i was very very fortunate to be able to work with this data and I always say I'm the tip of the iceberg here because the actual work is done by many, many people. So looking at this 30 years of data across the Amazon, we found that um, the recruits, so the trees that are getting into the system every year, they are becoming more dry affiliated over time. So you have um, a greater abundance of dry affiliated species over time. So the Amazon is becoming more adapted to dry conditions. But we also see an increase in the mortality of the species that are wet affiliated. So both in both components of the forest dynamics in the recruitment and in the in the mortality, we see this change. While you have an increase in dry affiliated species, you have in the recruitment, you have a, a loss of the wet affiliated ones. And this is not happening everywhere. So the death of drought affiliated species, drought vulnerable species is happening mostly in the dry areas of the Amazon. And um, if we expected, uh, if, if, we, if the forest was following, um, following climate, uh, kind of like uh, in a one-to-one -one line, we expect this gray line here to, to be observed. But actually what we see is a deviation from it, so we, which indicates that um, the pace of the forest is much slower than the pace of the changing climate. We also saw an increase in the abundance of large taxa, and this is actually the most a strong result. So across the whole community, we see that large trees are doing better. And this is in line with the expectations from the CO2 fertilization hypothesis. And uh, we see a decline in the in these species that are shade tolerant. So the small shade tolerant taxa, they had declined in abundance, which is potentially a consequence of increased li of light, light suppression. So you have these big trees dominating, and then you have a, a shaded, a more shaded uh, sub uh, sub canopy um, understory where then if you have more shade you're more likely to uh, die by light suppression this is just another way of showing the results uh, showing like what's behind them but uh, here we say we see kind of two components so this is the whole community and you see that the big uh, genera so the genera that have big big um, sizes are increasing over time and this is another component which is the recruitment and then you have a decline so here if it's below zero is decline in abundance and if it's above zero is increase in abundance over the last 30 years so this each point here is a slope basically for each species over time and then you see that um, the genus there are declining in abundance in terms of the recruit, recruiting um, recruiting trees. So what we see in terms of um, changes in species composition of the Amazon is basically that um, you have an increase in size and then a decline in and shade tolerant taxa, which both are in line with the CO2 fertilization hypothesis. And you also have an increase in the group of pioneer trees. So when we split um, this different, the species in these different groups, and we see that there is an increase in, in pioneer species. Uh, at the same time, we have some evidence for the um, importance of droughts driving the dynamics of this forest. So we, we see an increase in mortality of drought vulnerable species, but this is not happening everywhere. And you see an increase in dry affiliated recruits. Um, we don't see a decline in size um, as we expected for drought, which means that because many things are happening at the same time, maybe um, 
this over this declining size caused by drought is being compensated by the increase in CO2. This is a hypothesis that we put forward. So one of the main processes driving these changes is tree mortality. And um, I have been becoming more and more interested in tree mortality over time. And it's not just driving the changes in composition, but also driving the changes that we see in the carbon dynamics. So this is another, um, this is the kind of the whole picture from uh, this figure from the paper from Brennan et al, looking at the carbon dynamics across the Amazon. So this is what we see, the net biomass change, the overall um, kind of the result. Um, but then uh, behind this net biomass change, you have the causes of it. So you see that productivity, which is one side, which is kind of uh, the amount of carbon that goes into the system is increasing over time, and then it reaches a plateau. And we see the biomass mortality is increasing. Uh, there is a, a, a significant slope here. So mortality is probably causing that decrease in the capacity of absorbing carbon over time. So mortality plays a big role here in driving the dynamics of the Amazon. And it's a very diff difficult process to understand because it, more, tree mortality is quite stochastic and trees live for a very long time. The Amazon is a very diverse system. So it's very hard to understand the drivers behind tree mortality. Also, we see that um, this process is not taking uh, place everywhere in the same way. So in the Amazon, tree mortality is increasing. Here in this paper, they overlaid the previous figure on this blue figure here. So in, in brown, we have the Amazon. So in the Amazon, is, tree mortality is increasing over time. But for Africa, African forests in blue, apparently mortality is quite constant over time. It's not increasing. So different processes are happening differently in different places. Um, and here we we look at also stem so tree mortality is not only important in terms of trends but is also an important component of forest dynamics in terms of spatial distribution trying to understand if you try to understand uh, the distribution of above ground biomass tree mortality has an important role so before like there were a few studies showing that there is a relationship between tree mortality and productivity so more productive places have greater mortality rates. But uh, this study um, from Johnson et al. showed that, at least for the Amazon, uh, we don't really have this relationship between productivity and mortality. They are quite decoupled, but both are important to explain above ground biomass. So if you want to understand how biomass is distributed across the Amazon, so how carbon in the trees is distributed across the Amazon, we need to understand both processes, the carbon going in in terms of productivity and the carbon going out in terms of stem mortality. But the problem is that we don't really know how to model mortality very well. We don't understand mortality very well. And here uh, we can see that, so the top two maps, they show um, the distribution of mortality based on the inventory plots. Um, so this is above ground biomass losses and this is stem-based uh, stem mortality. So basically the proportion of trees per year that die and the rate of uh, biomass loss per year. And you see how the different models, so these are different um, dynamic vegetation models, they, they don't really um, capture very well the, the distribution, the spatial distribution predicted uh, by the inventory plots. So there are a few problems in understanding the processes behind tree mortality so we can then model and then eventually we can predict in the future how mortality varies um, across space and time. So with this question in mind of like what drives mortality in the Amazon, um, 
I I did some work with um, David Galbraith and and this is David Galbraith and Oliver Phillips from the University of Leeds, in collaboration with the Rainfall Network and the collaboration with Beatriz Marimon uh, from Unemachi in uh, Mato Grosso. And and here we really wanted to understand what drives tree mortality in the Amazon and what drives the spatial distribution of tree mortality across the Amazon. Our previous paradigm of how tree mortality varies across the Amazon was basically based on the availability of nutrients and the disturbance from wind. So in the West, where you have more nutrient availability in the soil, you will filter for species that can grow faster to make the most of that uh, great amount of nutrients, but they will also die younger and this forest will be much more dynamic. So you have in the West here, this is a paper from Beto Quesada from INPA showing that in the West, you have um, greater mortality rates. Um, and then in the East, North and East of the Amazon, you have lower mortality rates and this will be driven mainly by um, trees uh, investing less in growth but in but then in, in staying in living longer instead because of very low nutrient availability of these places so they will adopt a different strategy and um, in the west because the trees don't invest so much in structure they and they will die younger so they will be more successful susceptible to dry from wind disturbance so in this region in the west you see more trees that die broken or uprooted and in the north and the east you see more trees dying standing so this was the the picture that we had before and then we kind of redone this analysis of the distribution of stem mortality across the amazon but now with more data and what we found is that although yes the west is very dynamic compared to the north um and and the West has more mortality by broken and uprooted uh, but, uh, from trees that are broken or uprooted compared to, to the, the north. But still across the Amazon, you have a 50-50 divide. You have uh, half of the trees dying, more or less half of the trees dying from um, being broken or uprooted and the other half um, dying standing. And you still find very high mortality rates in regions like in the south southeast of the amazon where um, you don't necessarily have high nutrient availability and trees die mostly standing so this tells me that there is another cause of mortality that is important here that causes high mortality rates and and this is potentially um, related to water availability because this region in the in the south it's a very dry region. So then we went to study the risk factors behind tree mortality in these regions. Um, and traditionally, we know that there are two very important risk factors for tree death. One is the size of the tree. So uh, there are several studies showing that there is a this U shape between um, stem diameter and mortality so we have high mortality in for very sm small stems and then um, high mortality for very big stems and also there is this relationship between growth and the probability of death so trees that grow very fast they tend to have higher the trees that grow slow tend to have higher mortality probability because growth is an indication of loss of vitality. So when the tree is growing, growing less than it's expected to grow, then you expect that the tree is showing signs that it's about to die. But you, what you can see also in these uh, both graphs, you can see there's different lines doing different things. Uh, they are more or less all in the same direction, but there is a big spread. And these different lines are different species and what both graphs are saying is that basically you have 
a very different behavior for different species. So in this study, for instance, uh, by Kamak in PNIS, uh, they divide, if you divide um, these different lines in two groups, or the groups that um, basically have their fast growing and, and, and have higher mortality rates, you see a different, different slope in the in in the relationship between uh, growth and and mortality so basically species with high density for instance they they tend to have a lower decline with uh, an increase in growth and then species with low density the pioneer ones they tend to suffer more under low growth rates so then we also another important potentially re potential risk factor for the for the species is is drought we know that drought kill trees so there's a few uh, studies in the amazon showing that the increasing uh, drought intensity increases the proportion the the chance of death and we know that um, biomass mortality when you have droughts uh, you have this uh, kind of peaks uh, in the curve. So this is the graph of biomass mortality over time. And you see the peak in 95, the peak in 2005, and peak in 2010. So with this information, we constructed a model, uh, a survival model, that has um, different potential drivers. Uh, so so have, have risk factors at the STEM level, as I showed to you before. The very important drivers is uh, size and growth, so relative growth rate. So this is the growth at the stem level, but we also look at some variables at the species level. So here, maximum diameter of the species, the mean growth rate of the species, the wood density at the species level, and the drought tolerance at the species level. Here we use that index that I told, show, showed to you before, which is the water deficit affiliation as an index of drought tolerance. And these different risk factors, they are indicators of different potential drivers of stem mortality. So as the results here, you have the, you, you, I will show you the results based on of relative hazards. So basically, um, higher values in the y-axis represent higher probability of death. And here, um, different boxes show different risk factors. And the different colors are the different regions of the Amazon. So first thing is that species matter a lot. All the models that we had, um, the models of with species only, they had lower ASCs than the models with individual only. and the species growth rate in particular uh, was the most important predictor of, of tree death. So this is the most important result and is quite expected. So you expect that different species have different strategies. But for the tropics, this is the first time that this trade-off between growth and mortality was shown at, in such a, like, a large um, extent, so across the whole Amazon basin and with adult trees. We also show that uh, individual growth is very important. So size, which was expected to be very important, was not so important actually. And uh, growth was much more important. So the growth before the tree died is very important to predict whether the tree will die or not. Um, and we have different regions doing different things. So, for instance, individual growth rate is very important, but it's much more important in center Amazon where more, most trees die standing. So they dry, die from physiological related death. Then in the other regions where you have a higher proportion of trees dying from wind related causes. Um, and in the south of the Amazon, we see that trees with, they are more vulnerable to drought have higher um, mortality risk and it's interesting that that wasn't observed everywhere so i would expect that everywhere the more vulnerable trees are more the more drought vulnerable trees have higher mortality risk 
but actually this was only observed in the south of the Amazon. And this um, red line here is the East Central Amazon where you see the opposite. And there, um, we don't really know why that's the case, but in this region, we had a very big drought, uh, sorry, a very big flooding in, um, in the 90s, which potentially um, caused the mortality of the more drought tolerant species. But this is also a hypothesis. So again, we show the importance of drought tolerance, driving and selecting species. And here in particular in the south of the Amazon. Uh, and this is now uh, looking at this area to me became particularly important because this is the area where composition is changing the most. So we have more drought, um, drought vulnerable species dying and also the area where you have drought tolerance as a risk factor of mortality. And why is this region so different from the others? As we, we, you would expect that a region that is already in a dry area would have higher tolerance than compared to the more wet areas. But actually here, um, we have seen over time an increase um, in temperature that is very high. And this is potentially um, related somehow to deforestation. So this is the most, um, one of the most deforested areas of the Amazon. And recent studies have been showing that where you have um, higher deforestation, you also have an increase in temperature, a greater increase in temperature than expected. So for instance, here you have the, the frequency of, of pixels with, with and without um, land cover. So where you have a greater loss in land cover, you have a greater change in temperature. And also if you have greater deforested areas. So here, the, this is the, the area in uh, kilometer square loss within a big area. Then you have greater temperature change. And the green line here is the expected change, but you see that the more the more uh, deforested the region, the more the then temperature tends to change above expectations. So potentially this region, uh, the deforestation within this region is affecting not just the areas that were, are deforest um, themselves, but also the intact forests that are adjacent to this forest. So it's changing climate in a way that it's um, kind of accelerating uh, the, glo the global regional climate change. So this often raises the question of whether uh, we are reaching tipping, the tipping point. So this region, in, at least in this region. So you probably have seen uh, in the news, this study about um, from Lucia Nagashi and collaborators uh, a few weeks ago. So here, this is a massive study where they're flying the planes um, across the Amazon to get the atmospheric profile. And I won't explain in detail, but what's very interesting here is that they can get the fluxes in carbon. So here you have the order of the, the signs here, the opposite way as I showed previously in these trajectories of carbon fluxes in the Amazon. So here carbon sources are positive and carbon sinks are negative. But they have the sources of carbon that are from fires to the atmosphere, so in, in red and the sources of carbon from vegetation or, or the dynamics of carbon from vegetation, which is, let's say, fire-free carbon. And you can see that every region, the fire-free carbon, the green one, is negative, which means that in every region, you have um, the forest that is standing there um, absorbing more carbon than emitting, apart from this southern region, we coincides, which coincides to uh, our southern region where drought-driven mortality has increased over time. Um, and to me, like 
it's very interesting to see this because it means that a completely different sort of source of data is showing sim things quite similar to what we are seeing. So the processes that is going on here, of course, is, uh, is different from what's going on in other regions. Of course, that um, the net biomass exchange, which is this green bar, can be caused by several things and not just by tree mortality and tree growth. Here we're talking about um, soil respiration. You have you have the the also the fluxes from uh, areas that are not forests. But it's interesting to see that it's different here. And I wonder why whether tree mortality has a big role. So it would be interesting to try to understand the causes of this um, fire free. Um, fire-free emissions um, and 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 I expect that you have a greater increase in mortality in this region compared to other regions so this is something that we are working on now trying to understand what's driving this um, well trying to understand how tree mortality changes over time across the the the, re, the basing so was the spatial distribution of um, changes in tree mortality and whether then we can potentially relate to this um, net biomass, positive net biomass uh, change in the southern region observed by Luciana Gatti and colleagues. So before I finish, I would like to highlight um, a few um, a few new challenges, so a few things that we don't know and people have been now starting to look into. So one of the things is that we know little and we're starting now to understand about the influence of uh, local processes uh, in the response to climate change. So one example, for instance, is the influence of uh, water table depth. So in in Impai Manaus, uh, the group of Flavia Costa have been looking into this quite a lot and looking at the influence of water table depth, in depth into um, how forests respond to global change and to changes in climate. And one interesting study is, is this one by, led by Tayanich Souza, where they found that over during an El Nino drought where you increase uh, the drought stress, you actually see uh, a pattern that was maybe the opposite of what you would expect. You see an increasing recruitment and, um, and, and mortality didn't really increase. So uh, that tells us that these forests probably do better under drought than under normal conditions. So they are so uh, suppressed by by the, the water, so the high water availability all the time. So there's there's so much water all the time. Then when there is a drought, they actually release from this condition of uh, this anoxic condition and can actually um, then have higher recruitment and higher growth. So um, I think if you are interested in this, I recommend that you look at the studies from the group of Fabia Costa that have been doing amazing work on these more local processes and the relationship with those local processes and climate. Another um, big knowledge gap that we have is uh, what's happening with the big trees. So we know that big trees are very important for carbon dynamics. So the largest 1% of trees, they are responsible for around 50% of the carbon stocks and fluxes in the Amazon. and this is not just in the Amazon. So in, in the Atlantic forest, this is a study by Kawani Baudrin, um, supervised by, by Sandra Miller from Urgis, that have been uh, looking at the relationship between uh, the proportion of large size trees and above ground biomass. So also in the Atlantic forest, the trees that have more big trees have higher biomass, which is quite expected, but, uh, but it's very important in terms of conservation. And, what we see uh, in terms of carbon dynamics is that if you increase mortality rate um, by let's say 2%, uh, or we, you, you increase, um, you have a much bigger impact in the 
biomass carbon loss if this changing mortality rate happens for big trees than if it happens for trees between 10 and 50 centimeters. But these big trees are very rare. In, in these trees above uh, 50 centimeters, they, they are a small proportion of trees in, in the tropics. But, uh, but they, are, they are very important for carbon dynamics. So the new challenge now is to try to understand what causes the, the mortality of these big trees. We know very little about, but we expect, so this is from a review work, we expect that uh, these big trees are mostly killed by, uh, by abiotic drivers, with the exception of fire, lightning, wind, and water stress tend to kill more big trees. And then if those three stresses increase over time, then you see a big impact in the carbon fluxes from these big trees over time as well. Uh, another uh, big challenge is to try to understand uh, how biotic interactions will change with environmental change. And here, uh, by doing this review, we figure out that we know very little about the relationship between uh, pathogens and, and herbivores and, and trees and how, how pathogens and herbivores can um, lead to tree death. So. We also know very little how this will change or how this vary across space and, and, and climate and how this will change with uh, the changing environment. So understanding um, relationships between um, trees and other biotic um, and, and other, uh, other components of the biota are very important to understand the future of the forests, of tropical forests. So I would like to finish in a positive note. Uh, uh, there is a lot that we have to do to stop global change and to uh, fight this big challenge. As scientists, we can study and we can um, try to address this by investigating what's happening. But also as citizens, uh, it's very important that we If you see, if you think you can see the half glass empty and see this is very negative because we've been emitting a lot since then, but also this shows that we change our behavior in a way that man, that actually made us emit so much more in such a, a short amount of time, and I think if we manage to change our behavior then we can change our behavior now, and and reduce emissions. Jurassic. So if you're interested about um, Amazon and global change and also other aspects about uh, Amazonian forests that I didn't mention here, maybe more political side or, or more uh, human um, social sciences side, you should check the science panel for the Amazon, which is now open for public consultation. So it would be great to have the inputs from scientists across Brazil and across the world on uh, our work on the science panel for the Amazon. So uh, check the link and uh, several uh, chapters are open for contribution now. So thanks everyone, obrigada uh, for listening to me. And again, this is not just my work, this is the work of many, many people. And I look forward to hearing your questions, thanks. Thanks, Adriani, for your amazing talk and updating our knowledge about the dynamics of the Amazon forests. Uh, we have, uh, we are open to questions. Please post your questions on our chat. We already have a few, uh, so let's start here. Uh, right. So. Jefferson Bugoni, start uh, thanking you for your great talk and asking to what extent your findings on the effects of drought on tree mortality can be extrapolated to other tropical forests. Mm, that's a good question and tricky question. So I think um, the processes 
are similar everywhere. So uh, the processes could be similar everywhere. Uh, so let's say you have an increase in drought or you have a certain um, uh, MCWG and that changes, then you could potentially uh, kill trees in a, in a... So in theory, it could be the same everywhere. But in practice, it's different. So uh, we know that in... in in Africa, for instance, uh, African forests, um, things are very different than in the Amazon, potentially because um, trees there are more uh, used to, to drought, but also because then you don't have a drought that is as hot as in the Amazon. So in, in Africa, uh, the El Nino drought, for instance, so there is a very good paper from Amy Bennett in PNAS looking at the El Nino drought in Africa. Basically, what she says is that the impacts are not as much as we predict based on our Amazonian studies. So um, probably because droughts there, droughts there are not as hot as the droughts that we see in the neotropics. And, and if you go to other forests, like the Atlantic forest, for instance, you don't necessarily have, um, at least in the coast, you don't necessarily have uh, such a... Um, a strong dry season uh, in some areas, so then droughts might not reach like the limits of of um, of the forest. What we are finding overall is that drought mortality is bad in the in tropical forests, but it's especially bad in very dry areas. So especially bad bad in the south of the Amazon, especially bad in some regions in the dry forests of Costa Rica. So it's not happening everywhere. And I think that's a good news. Like they, there is some level of tolerance, and it's quite maybe a strong level of tolerance for um, trees. Uh, but the problem is that um, there is a limit. In be in beyond that limit, trees tend to suffer quite a lot, and drought tend to increase quite strongly. So that's what we saw in El Nino in Costa Rica. That's what we saw in this. That's what being seen in the south of the Amazon. So I see some people from the south of the Amazon here in the chat, Paulo, Simone, and, and they being seen that in, in their plot. Thank you. Uh, we have a related question, but not to other tropical forests, but related to the Amazon wetlands. So Tiago um, wants to hear uh, how much do you expect your findings to extend to flood tolerant trees in the wetlands? And then he he adds that it, he's talking about the Amazon wetlands. Okay, yeah, good question, Thiago. I don't know. Uh, I think this is something that we have to look into. Um, and and that's what Flavia somehow in Flavia Flavia Costa's group have trying have been trying to do in in Impa, looking at uh, not. So it's not flooded forests. These are f uh, basically um, uh, forests under in sh shallow water conditions, shallow water table conditions. But um, I think um, we still don't know much about wetlands at all, and I'm not aware really of um, how much they would be affected by drought. I'll guess that maybe quite a lot uh, from some. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's a good question, and I think we have to study uh, wet, uh, wetlands, and probably you know more, Thiago. <laughs> yeah, that's my answer, basically. Thank you. Uh, so Juliana Cordeiro also has a question. She thanks you for the great talk, and she asks, if, have you looked uh, at whether there's a phylogenetic yeah. sino in tree mortality? If whether certain uh, clades are more vulnerable to drought, for example. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's also a good question. And um, so this is something that we have been looking into, but still uh, we have we haven't done like really like a, a proper analysis, but. Um, we know that a few clades, like more early clades, like Magnoligi, for instance, they have um, they they don't they don't have species that are tolerant to drought. So uh, potentially drought tolerant evolve a bit later. But we we didn't look uh, in particular in the drought tolerance of um, of uh, like in in the phylogeny in, in phylogeny. Um, but 
but yeah, this is this is a good point. And I think there is some work from the group of uh, Kyle Dexter in Edinburgh looking into that, but not necessarily in the Amazon, I don't think. So, or maybe maybe in the Amazon, yes. But I, 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 we haven't we haven't looked into that, and I think that that it's likely that there is a case that that's the case, but we we haven't looked into that. Thanks, Adriani. Uh, we are still open for questions, so if anyone has uh, other questions, please post it in the chat. I have one. <laughs> um, I really like the talk, but I'm curious uh, about your opinion on ne next questions to be answered. So what would be the things like the priority uh, issues uh, that should be explored in dynamics of the uh, Amazon forests? Um. So I think um, local processes are very important, as I mentioned, and understanding what's happening in other forests outside. So these are basically Teja Firmi forests. And I think it would be interesting to look in other types of forests. So uh, like Thiago mentioned, the wetland forest and also um, the white sun forest and understanding these processes in other types of forests. I think this is one, uh, one important frontier. And then uh, I really, I'm really interested in understanding more about um, interactions between trees and pathogens and trees in other biotic drivers. Because outside the tropics, the main mortality events that we see, and these are like big outbreaks, big mortality outbreaks that happen in the US, uh, for instance, and, and they were very related to biotic um, infestation. So you have a drought, then you have a bark beetle, then you have lots of mortality. And we haven't seen that in the tropics and the hypothesis behind that is that uh, we have high diversity. So it's kind of like the forest is buffered and protected. So this high diversity protects uh, the forest against um, high mortality events. But I don't know to what extent that's true. First, I don't think it has been tested. And second, we don't know to what extent one pathogen can just kind of like go crazy and start invading and start killing many trees at once. So I think it will be very interesting in that, uh, to understand the biotic relations, but it's very hard because we have a massive diversity. Um, and then other things that are not in my field, but I think are very pressing now, is to understand the interaction between humans and the forest. So trying to find a solution. So I think we now need to move forward uh, and try to find a solution for these problems. And in terms of more the social aspect, what can we do so we preserve the Amazon as as we as we know it, and and at least a high. Uh, um, large extent of forests as we need we know we need for our carbon dynamics and for many other reasons so it's not just carbon <laughs> but <laughs> <for> diversity is <laughs> uh, for social aspects for everything but uh, i think uh there are many people doing amazing work on that front but i think that front is definitely a priority yeah i agree <laughs> thank you i'm very curious uh, about uh, future research and this relationship with the social components as well as it's a great challenge so we have more questions and have people thanking you uh i will highlight, highlight kawani here uh mm -hmm. thanking you for uh the collaboration and so jeff has a second question he says that you show that in some areas tree draft is related to wind are cli climatic extreme events like storms of concern as well yes they are uh, uh, and also not just wind but lightning is probably like going to, so we don't know what's going to happen in the future in terms of uh it's very hard to predict uh how the patterns of wind are going to change and lightning are going to change so drought in a way it's kind of easier to predict than wind uh, but yeah, climatic events and big storms, they, they kill lots of trees already. And outside the plots in this, there is this big blowdowns in the Amazon. Um, and if they increase, you, we will see massive uh, change in the dynamics of the Amazon as well. Thanks, Adriani. Uh, so another one here. 
uh, knowledgeable talk, how do you propose to break down into more simpler or small, smaller factors that contributes to the positive CO2 emissions at the southern Amazon? Mm, simpler and smaller factors. Ah, okay. You mean uh, from the Lucia Nagashi paper, maybe? Um, so I think maybe we should look at different. So first, look at what can cause that uh, increase in CO2 emissions from uh, that region. Um, so one 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 potential driver is tree mortality. So we need to look into that, but also need to look into an increase in respiration, potentially linked to increase in temperature. We need to look into that, um, and then increase respiration not just from the trees but also from soil and then really see and then also there are some changes in the landscape that happen there so it's not just forest it's outside the forest so basically it's like many components but i think um, it would be nice to look at these different components and understand the contribution of each of them it's a big big task i think um, not just from the forest side but from the other uh, perspectives as well but uh you could if you understand processes very well then you could uh, scale that up. So understanding the processes that are happening like in the ecosystem level on those regions um, are very important now to then um, disentangle what's going on in that, in that region as well. Thanks, Nani. Uh, we have another question uh, related to your talk. And then I'll move to a different question related to general <laughs> professional uh, career. So Enrique asks uh, if you could make a prognostics. Which region do you think could increase tree mortality over the Amazon in the upcoming years, apart from the southeastern? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I, okay, uh, I think from our data, mortality would potentially increase following deforestation so when i'm when i say mortality is not mortality that killed are killed like not trees that are killed by men but in the remaining forest a landscape with higher fragmented more fragmented high landscape is likely to have higher mortality rates um, because of the changing temperature so i would say that potentially the north uh east but then so we talk about southeast, northeast, where deforestation has increased massively. You see a big increase there. If, if I can, that's my prediction. And then there may be, and then the least uh, likely to the the region that is least likely to have an increase in mortality is the very wet, the very wet areas in the west. So there, I think the forest is quite protected. But then there are some some regions where you have a dry season that is already quite strong, then these are the regions that are more likely to suffer increasing tree mortality. But um, I think that the good news is that we still have massive areas of the Amazon where you have very um, small dry season. They're very protected uh, from climate change for now. At, yeah, unless temperature increases a lot. But yeah, we have also some positive news, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> and the positive one of understanding more the factors <laughs> related to to these dynamics. So we have a question from Luciana. Uh, so she's thanking you for for your talk, and she wants you to describe briefly your career. I think this is really interesting as uh, you we, you were a former colleague uh, of us here in the department and uh, now a lecturer uh, across the ocean. So I think that's uh, interesting for, for our colleagues and, and students to hear about uh, your story a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. So I did my master's. I did my undergrad in um, Curitiba, FPR, and then my master's in Urgis, um, master's in ecology. And then when I was finishing my master's, um, Sandra, my supervisor, Sandra Miller, she sent me an email saying, oh, Adriani, I think this opportunity suits you. Uh, it was an opportunity to work at the University of Leeds with um, Amazon and Global Change. 
And then I apply for this opportunity and I end up um, getting the position here at Leeds. Well, not here, but in Leeds, uh, which is near here. And, and then I had the chance to, I think it's a bit of luck because I had the chance to work with uh, very important, very, a very supportive group that uh, where I had a lot of support um, to have, to actually um, learn a lot and, and produce nice papers during my PhD. So this was very important. I had I had lots of support from my supervisors. And, um, and then I started doing a postdoc here at Leeds, in Leeds as well, continuing the work. And then, then I started another postdoc um, in Birmingham. But now this is not something that I showed to you today, but looking at um, um, tree mortality at a global scale. So this is the work I've been doing more recently. Um, and then my opportunity at the University of Birmingham appeared to apply for a Birmingham Fellow, which is a which is a position they have um, to. It's basically it's a position they have for people that are in the postdoc phase, but uh, and and are um, and, and are quite research focused to then kind of continue doing research, but then having a permanent position. So I apply for that. But because of COVID, they cut the, the funding and stuff. I didn't get it. But then because I had applied, then I was invited to apply for another position. And then I got the position as a lecturer here. Um, what can I say? I think there is a lot of things. The first thing is uh, it's there is a, um, a, a certain aspect of luck of working with the right people at the right time and having good mentors that um, kind of helped me applying for positions when I thought I, I, sometimes you think you cannot do it and then people say, no, you can do it, go for it. And I think that's very important. I think we doubt ourselves a lot, uh, at least I do. So I think um, I think we should trust ourselves in our science and, and, and go for it as well. Um, and, and there is also like, I tried to apply for positions in Brazil and I didn't get it. And then I end up uh, staying here. And I, which I, I enjoy a lot, but I, I think um, sometimes there are lots of positions outside. So if you are a Brazilian working in Brazil and you want to move somewhere else, there are lots of positions outside Brazil. And, and I'm sure that I have lots of colleagues in Brazil that are amazing uh, scientists that could uh, be very competitive for this position. So it's a matter of understanding how the system works and understanding what you need to do. It's like when you are in Brazil and want to apply for a position in Brazil, you only get it if you understand how the system works. So trying to spend some time understanding how the system works and how things work and what you need to apply, but also there, there are several things that count, so being, bring, Building collaborations, trying to work a bit independently from your supervisors, these things help a lot. Um, yeah, so if you need any particular <laughs> advice, you can email me. But I think uh, mainly it's like believing on yourself and and trusting your science and going for what you feel like you want and being passionate about the things you do. And and as always, like there are so many rejections and so many failures. And we, in the end, we only see the success of other people, but um, you have to be ready to to hear no's a lot and to yeah see rejections all the time. But, but then eventually, <laughs> eventually uh, you end up, um, I think, uh, getting, a, uh, getting what you want, I think, from, from your career and, yeah, and I think a Brazilian scientist in Brazil uh, is not behind any, anyone else, you know? Like, uh, there are so many good scientists in Brazil, and really it's about... Now it's very unfortunate that there is not enough funding in Brazil to hire everyone, and, and it's a very sad moment, but I think uh, eventually... Uh, well, but I think Brazilians are competitive globally and, and could uh, apply for positions globally. Thank you for uh, telling us a, a bit of your story. It's, uh, I think that's really important. I thank Luciana for asking that because I see a lot of colleagues um, 
especially students that uh, doubt that they they can get something uh, outside Brazil as if it was a different world. So it's it's nice to to approximate uh, those possibilities and and see uh, that's possible. And you are here to to show us as, as that as well. Uh, it's so. I think we don't have any other questions. If someone has a last minute questions, please post it quickly. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we will uh, thank. So we have a lot of people thanking you, Nani, for, for your talk. Uh, it was great having you here today. And uh, I don't know if you have, uh, you want to say something, um, leave a, a last, Take home message, uh, and then we we can finish our streaming. Ah, I just want to thank you and mm -hmm. uh, thank everyone for uh, joining the talk. It's a bit weird because you don't see anyone, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, thanks. It's great to speak to your friends again and to um, again uh, the the Pepe, like ecology the ecology course in in in, uh, in Porto Alegre really. Uh, shaped my my career as well. So I think it's, I'm very grateful for everyone there. So it's great to be back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but it, too bad it's it's not in person, but <laughs> that's the, the moment that, that, that we have now. So uh, we, uh. we miss you here. <laughs> uh, okay, so thank you everyone for, for watching. In a month, we will have uh, a new, an, another talk. Uh, of our series and please uh, keep an eye on, on our media where we'll uh, share and advertise it uh, soon. See you all in a month. <laughs>